Okay, good afternoon everyone. So, um, it is actually my honor this afternoon to present um, part of the passionate work I have been doing since my graduation in 2004. So actually, this is almost 10 years of reporting what has been done on Philippine geometry. Okay. This particular topic is special to me because the first time I talked was I was actually the um, extensionist also for the university. So my first training in talking to the public was through the museum also. And my first talk was like a baptism of fire. Uh, wala akong mabuong kahit anong salita. I literally choked and stuttered all the way, all throughout my paper presentation. But because the museum forces you to talk to a lot of people, even if you don't want to. So now, my training as a faculty was mainly because of the Museum of Natural History. So if you look at the overview of geometry in the Philippines, you will notice that much of the work entailed around the 1920s during the American regime. So most of the works here from, are from North Luzon. I didn't even bother to report my work on geometrics because I had stopped working on geometrics for a few years and focused most of my attention currently on spiders. So the subfamilies that we have been working on here in the Philippines would be the subfamily Enochromini, Desmobacidini, Geometrini, Sterini, Laurentini, and Enomini. And why is there a low turnout? One, very few choose entomology as a field of study. As mentioned by Sheng, it's either most of the entomologists I know are my relatives. And the world is very small for us that I even married another entomologist who was actually my blackmate because the only person who, who can understand my world must be also an entomologist. And a fraction of this entomologist specialize in taxonomy. So very few choose the task of working in taxonomy because it is a tedious task. The first thing my advisor asked me when I was asking her if she could be my PhD advisor was that, are you sure you are still willing to go into systematics or taxonomy? Because she has spent her life's work working on insect taxonomy that she never got around to marry. He said, you may be single for life. <laughs> so she only accepted me upon the introduction of my ex-boyfriend, who is now my husband now. <laughs> so that was the key in pursuing my PhD study. Because she would not accept me unless she knew I had a love life. So it's very important to have a love life if you plan to pursue taxonomy. Culturally speaking, apart from the difficulty that taxonomy entails, the moths and their larvae are often seen or portrayed as pests. So if you look at traditional comic books in the Philippines, monsters are usually portrayed as either giant spiders, giant caterpillars. So most people ask me why work on spiders and why choose to work on moths. So my family is already involved with spiders, so why not work on the underdog groups? So on the side, I also work on Lepidoptera, just to get off the family business. Because you will have limited um, stuff to talk, talk about on the dining table if you just talk about spiders. So once in a while, we insert a bit of other groups. And we have, as Filipinos, weird cultural beliefs. So the scales of moths are thought to cause blindness. Notice that most of your grandparents will tell you if you hold on to butterflies or actually moths, not really the butterflies, the moths are very notorious that if you hold on to the wings of the moth, you will go blind, which is actually not true. Another weird fact is that moths are usually known to embody the soul of the departed relatives. So who would want to pin and preserve your great-grandmother or great-grandfather inside an insect box? 
So who would want to do that? Um, I don't think anybody ever. Well, that is my great grandmother. That is my great grandfather. This is my uncle. This is my uncle's uncle. So well, in in Filipino culture, if you see a moth flying, usually they tell you that you have a departed relative visiting or monitoring you. So because of that, you have very limited studies. And much of the studies are limited to the Luzon area. Besides in Mindanao, we have very few working on this. Most of the individuals working on this are foreigners, especially in the Mindanao region. A checklist of the species and subspecies maintained in terms of depositories, the highest recorded number is at the British Museum of Natural History. So if you're interested in working on Philippine geometric moths, then you go to the British Museum of Natural History. Although in Germany, they already have a larger collection now, but they haven't really published the numbers yet. Most of these collections are still undergoing DNA barcoding, so they haven't really finalized the numbers. In local um, repositories, this would include the Bureau of Plant Industry, because the first entomologists also work at the Bureau of Plant Industry, so they maintain some old collections. Unfortunately, they don't really have a full-time curator there to take care of everything, and they don't have any budget to buy any preservative materials for their collections. The last time I talked to the curator there, a year after, he already had cancer. So I don't know if he's still alive. The University of San Carlos Museum also is an important repository because the first collections by the German um, monk was actually deposited in the University of San Carlos Museum. But upon visit, they aren't really much in good condition. So not really different from what is in the Bureau of Plant Industry collection. They don't even have budget to buy the mothballs that you need to uh, put inside the boxes. And it's not really a priority area for them as they are pursuing marine studies. The National Museum of Natural, uh, Museum of Natural History or the National Museum in um, the Philippines is supposedly the largest repository, but most of their collections is biased against the collection for butterflies. The moths collection, they aren't really sorted yet, and they haven't really um, tried documenting it more efficiently because there are, for example, specimens with five pins and only one label. So in terms of reporting, if they were actually collected from that particular area, it's very dubious. And then, you have the Museum of Natural History in UP Los Baños. So for the most part, these are the subfamilies of geometrids. So for your information, when we talk about geometrids in Filipino, you call this the mandadangkal. So they are larvae that appear to crawl around measuring the earth, such as um, the green ones of the family geometrini. So you also term them as earth measurers. Anomaly would be one of the largest subfamilies. This is my area of concern. But um, when you tackle geometrics, you can help but simply look at the other subfamilies too. Say, for example, geometry me. The green coloration is very distinctive to the subfamily. The green coloration, we call that as geoverdin. At one time, they hypothesized that the geoverdin is a byproduct of the liver or a bile substance. But upon observation, it's actually a form of chlorophyll also. And they're studying it now because it's a sensitive pigment that changes as it reflects light. With um, anomaly, meanwhile, these are more commonly identified by looking at the abdomen. So just imagine if your pelvis has a pair of ears. So. One very distinct way you can identify this group is if you look at the first segment of their abdomen, you will find ear-like notches, which are hypotheses that they are capable of returning back the sounds of bats, so the bats get deterred from eating them. 
Um, oil promeni are yellow colored moths and they're very delicate. So when you collect them, they, you can easily actually remove the legs just by holding them. In Terini and Laritini, you more often find these groups in higher elevations. So these are what you call as the tympanal organs that occur in the subfamily in nomini. It's very tricky because when you are in the field, when you apply for permit for collecting, you cannot really say what specific species you are collecting, but rather you can just say the subfamily. And when you are identifying in the field, you cannot really tell if the flying moth is that particular subfamily because again, you really have to look at the ears. And there's even one uh, particular moth family the only difference is that the ears would be at the last thoracic segment. So that's like the ears on the waist, and then the other one would be the ears at the pelvis. So there's very little space in between those two segments. So if you're working in the field and it's hovering above you, there is no way of telling whether you're catching a uranid or a geometric. More so, if they are flying, remember they're scaly, and the only way you can identify the subfamily is through the wing folds or the wing veins. I don't think there's anyone with sharper vision who could literally look up the sky and tell, oh, that's an only because M1 and M2, M3 is missing. So it's very difficult to do. I only see M1, M2, uh, M3. M2 is missing, so that means that is an only. There is no way to determine that if the moth is flying, even when it's at rest, it's virtually impossible unless you already have a dead specimen with you. So, in terms of Philippine anomaly, you have the following tribes. You have Boarmi Aini with 29 genera and 122 species. These are the records we have so far. You have Aptini, Kasimaini, Kamiraini, Yutoaini, Gunantotaini, and Hypocrosaini. So, you have 8 genera here and 16 species. But if you look at the records, also with the tiny, um, this one are, is a beautiful group because they're larger. I, I don't want to look at the smaller moths because I don't want to lose my vision very early. Since the group is very large, I have the uh, privilege of choosing the larger ones. Um, for this one, you have Abraxas. Notice the stained wings are not actually because of poor preservation techniques. That's actually the print that they have. Um, you had at, at Illuminata from Zambales, one from Bataan, this species from Baguio and Cagayan, Luzon, and also um, Baguio. So some of the notations are very vague. Sometimes they just indicate North Luzon. So you assume it's within this region. So far, museum collections have verified that we still have an Illuminata. The rest of the species we have yet to confirm. All of these collections are recorded and are deposited at the British Museum of Natural History. The ones we have in the Philippines is only at Ad Illuminata, which is found in Masindok, Sambales. This one is also a larger moth. I'll explain to you why the moths look this way. They're not really at, as attractive as the butterflies, but mainly because of later, I'll explain it. You have Cabimargo, Preembrata. That's why moths are very notorious as boring subjects for taxonomy. Unlike their butterfly stepsisters, which are more popularly um, colored ones, so you tend to draw affinity for the more beautiful Lepidoptera. But I would beg to disagree. So the ones that we have here so far, based on our museum collections, is that we have Cabimargo, Preumbrata, which are all, one is from Mount Makiling and one is from North Luzon. If you look at this, when they are alive, they are colored like lichens. So they're not really white or cream. This would be the more medium-sized moths. These are collections from the Natural History Museum. So notice that the pins that they use 
are the ones that we use for um, dice maker spins, which are not really very good in terms of preservation. Ah, no, this is from the Bureau of Plant Industry. I remember the pin. And the one that you find only in North Luzon would be the Midona Coronifera. When they are alive, they're actually metallic blue. And these are day flyers, unlike our misconceptions about moths being nocturnal in nature. And you find this hovering within Baguio City, but the residents of Baguio City have no idea that they have an endemic species hovering within their regions. The construction of a new mall and the construction of industrialized zones in Baguio City are creating a few threats on this because when they open the lights, they create light traps for these insects. So when, come morning time, you find a lot of these trapped insects inside buildings and they just simply sweep this off. But this particular species was very famous around the 1970s because this almost decimated majority of the pine trees in Baguio City. Pumutik na talaga siyang maubos. And the way by which they treated this is they sprayed a lot of copper sulfate in Baguio City. Such that we don't really know if all of these types, they have different wing forms. They exhibit what we call polymorphism. But the type that we observe so far would be only the basalis type and the coronifera type. We haven't really observed stellata and pretiosa in the past few years. So the practice of spraying there may have affected some of these types within the region. You also have um, Fulgida. If you notice, this is a headless specimen. Literally, you're not even breathing when you are handling this specimen. Otherwise, you might lose all of the insect altogether. And this was the sole specimen for this Fulgida. This one is Rabdota. There are other moths that look like this. They are called ghost moths. Um, some of the more economically important ones have a rose following the stoppage of spraying mangoes during early flowering season. So these are creating secondary pests, such as the Zamarada. So the Zamarada would look like this. Notice that if you are looking at the geometer, the only legs you will find would be at the terminal end of the body. The rest would be here. The pro legs would be there. So it looks like a snake. It even acts like a snake, such that when it is threatened, it takes a snake-like stance. Only that it is very small. So para bang sinasabi niya na, naliliitan ka ba sa akin? Ang dumijay boy sa akin. <laughs> so it's just this small so you hardly even see it when it's already in the inflorescence of the mango the only time you will take notice of it is that when it starts to produce the silk when it's ready to pupate so it pupates on the soil underneath the leaves of mango particularly carabao mango this was from San Juan Batangas. But if you place the larvae here within the flowers, you don't really notice them. They feed on the pollen of the inflorescence because pollen is very nutritious. The pupa would look like this. So very simple. So if it's covered by dried leaves, you don't really get to see it anymore. Here is another one. This is a marada, again from mango also. And it has horn-like protuberances on its head, unlike the one I showed you earlier. And then it's the pupa are also girdled here. And then there, it is square-shouldered. And these are a few of the geometries from Mount Makiling. You have the day-flying moths, this panea, and the aporandria. So, um, most of these aren't really in good condition because at that time I was still practicing how to collect these moths. I learned the hard way that you're not really supposed to look at UV light traps for so long. <laughs> I think my colleagues also know that. 
I forgot to tell them not to look at UV lights for so long because it dries your eyes and gives you a terrible migraine. Uh, they learned that also the hard way. Uh, and they told me that if you use UV light, because again, it's uh, radiation, you may not be able to have kids. Nobody told me that. Good thing I still have two. This is Pingasa Flora, also exhibiting a lichenous form. But look at the underside, it's brightly colored in yellow. And the bands are very distinct for the species. This is Pingasa Ruby Montana, again also from Mount Makini. And then, can you guess where the pupa is? Can you back? Yeah. Yeah. You find them here. What about in this photo? Easier when it's close up. Sabi nga nito, but dyan lang yan. Somewhere out there. Especially here. So it, it's really very difficult looking at the biology of different groups of insects because they are very small. And sometimes, when you go out, you don't find the adults. Rather, you find the immature forms. So who would bother to check all of the leaves of the plant and check it? You have to be crazy. That's why I'm crazy. <laughs> so this is another recorded for, I think also for mango. Um, this is a sterine from the sterine family. And some new challenges along the way, especially with the development of different uh, molecular techniques that are running along with basic taxonomy or traditional taxonomic techniques, is that how do you kill these moths now? There are contending procedures by which you kill these moths. The classic one is you use cyanide. Everyone who is working on Lepidoptera will use cyanide. But cyanide is not available in the Philippines. It's either you get it from cyanide fishermen, or you will be suspected as someone involved in drugs. So if someone places a cardboard over me, you know what I have been doing. <laughs> The other alternative would be ethyl acetate. But for those of you who have used ethyl acetate as a killing agent, it's not really that good. If you walk to the mountains for two hours, three hours, you have to make sure that whatever you catch is worth the travel. If you use ethyl acetate, these um, wings, these scales, are only moistened, ruining the specimen altogether. So you never use it. And then there's the alternative, refrigeration. Those who would like to work on the molecular part of Lepidoptera, such as geometrids, encourage us to use refrigerators. But who would have the time and the energy to carry a refrigerator or even find a plug where in most of the mountains here don't even have electricity? So they recommend the use of dry ice. But then again, remember we are an island country. The sari-sari stores or the mom and pop shops do not even carry <coughs> dry ice. So how can you bring it? For example, if our travel is around 10 hours, by the time you get to bring the dry ice up the mountain, no more. <laughs> so our recourse would still be cyanide. And as much as possible, if you can afford to refrigerate it or bring ice, then well and good. But otherwise, our recourse would be cyanide. So it's also taking care of the specimen, making sure that your efforts count. But how to be a mummy? Or how do you preserve something? So it's actually an art. Some of you will tell me, because if you collect a lot of these moths, you cannot really spread them all at once. So you have to save some for later. Then you simply relax them. They say that if you use ammonia injection, it's a quick fix. You can readily relax the specimen 
uh, easier for you to spread the wings so that you can see the venations. But if you're working on the molecular of this particular group or any lepidopteran group, if you use ammonia, it could also contaminate it or it could even melt down some important proteins. Mouth rings. So they say that you can actually use, um, you can moisturize it by enclosing it in uh, a box filled with water, but instead of putting, what do we put to preserve animals? Formalin. Uh, you replace it with a mouthwash. That is what they recommend. But one other school of thought is you try steaming it. So instead of putting just normal temperature water inside a container, you put boiled water inside. But remember to cover the specimen so the steam, when it condenses into water, will not ruin your specimen. So these are some of the techniques by which we are starting to practice so we can preserve the specimen. Again, with, when we look at the this one, one disadvantage of using cyanide, for example, if you put it long term inside the jar, it also discolors. And if you preserve the specimens inside the boxes, the humidity in the Philippines also discolors them. That's why you need refrigeration for long term storage of these moths, which is very expensive. And especially if we have a lot of brown owls or black owls just like this afternoon. So it explains why the colors of these moths have been dull. It's not really a priority to preserve them under refrigerated conditions because it's expensive. But it doesn't mean that it cannot be done. So again, it's an art. So they say that while we do not know the purpose of geometrics now, and they're asking, every time you propose a project, what would be the significance of the study? I can't really answer that. Because most of the products of basic studies will be appreciated long before I am gone. But only because of this, we will conserve only what we love. We love only what we understand. And we will understand only what we have been taught. And while we do not recognize their value now, it doesn't mean they are no less important than us. So thank you very much. <laughs>